Well, we've just taken in this chair. And uh, how do we start? What is our plan on this chair? Well, of course, we don't know until we analyze a few things, make some observations, and ask some questions. Now, someone online wrote in their review of a hooker recliner. They said, we bought a hooker recliner and a Bradington Young sofa in January of this year. There was a worn spot on the leather that showed orange through within a month. And that's exactly what we're looking at here in this chair. Also, a few months in, we sent it back along with the sofa on which the leather appeared to be peeling and fading. Sounds like urethane, doesn't it? So as we analyze our chair, we can keep in mind that this is likely a common problem. First of all, it's uh, noteworthy that the brown top coat has come off so readily. And so a good question is, how soft is that brown top coat? Now the customer wondered why all of this yellow orange down here well, as you can tell, the yellow orange is supposed to show through, like on the backrest here. But of course it's darker around the sides. So this is worn off, the brown is worn off here. Let's get a good look on the sides here and see what it's supposed to look like. So a little bit of the yellow orange is supposed to show through but not as much as we saw on the backrest. Here we have hardly any showing through, just a hint of it. So that's going to be our target. This is going to be our target. Now the other thing that we have <clears throat> is on this side we have some paint that's been splattered up on here and the customer has tried to take it off and not been successful and so uh, we'll have to see if we can remove that or are we going to get into trouble so likely the oils from the hands softened uh, the arms so that the brown got soft and came off same as the hair oils here uh, but I wondered what in the world would cause this to clean off so readily from the base coat. And uh, Adonita pointed out that there is a heart, upside down heart shape right here, right in the middle. I'll try to get a, a picture. I can see that. I'm not sure if it shows up with the camera too well. So someone may have tried to clean the ink off and cleaned all the brown off in doing so. I think that helps to understand why the problem here. Then maybe the cleaner itself left this soft so that uh, in subsequent usage the brown came off. The other question that arises is why does the brown come off so completely from the yellow orange? And uh, could it be that these are two uh, incompatible um, types of coatings? <clears throat> For example, if you had a shelf in your house that had been painted with an oil-based paint, and then uh, because it has a slick surface, you put the latex paint on top of that, you know that in short time that latex paint is going to peel off of the oil base because first of all with the oil base you're going to have to deglaze that right you're going to have to take the shine off of it take the slickness off of it maybe even sand it uh, and prime it before you can put the top coat latex on there did something similar happen here where we had incompatibility 
between these two coatings? So those are good questions. Uh, the other question is, since we already have the base coat, which is perfectly fine and durable, there's no break in the, in the base coat. It has not been affected by whatever else affected the top coat. Can we match up this dark brown? Well, that's what we're going to do next. The first thing we want to look at is this is our dark brown. This is our number 140 dark brown pigment. But notice that this dark brown is not as dark brown as we need. So we need to make our dark brown darker. Value wise, we're aiming for darker. Also, notice that the brown is yellowish in comparison to the leather. The leather looks more violet in comparison. So we want to darken it, but we also want to move toward violet. Now we could use violet. Let me get some violet. Of course, violet is very dark but it's way blue. We don't need that much blue. Our violet needs to be a reddish violet. And we can see that especially when we compare that to the yellow. So let's try another approach. In the other approach we can take our 110 black and that's going to give us the darkness. That's going to contribute to the dark value that we're looking for. And remember that black is rather bluish. If we made a gray out of black and white, we would get a bluish gray. So black has a hint of blue. And what do we need to add to that to make a violet? Our darkest red possible, which in this case is our 131 true red. That is our darkest red. But coupled with black, that is coupled with the bluishness of black, could give us a very dark violet which will change our stock dark brown to the darkness that we want. Let's see how that works out. So let's say that we wanted to mix four ounces of dark brown to do this whole chair. So we need about an ounce of pigment. Most of it could be our 140 dark brown. There you can see it, that it's light and it's yellow. So we're going to add our dark black. So we can add to that our black. And our true red. Now this is pigment, so what you see is what you get, and I'm still not red enough, so let's add some black and some red still. And 
more red than black this time and the red has the intention of getting us our our violet look we're still not there with the red let's add some more red So we're getting really close. We don't know if that's enough red, but uh, since we're so close, let's add our clear at this point. And we want to use our high gloss clear. <clears throat> and the reason for the high gloss clear is we want the depth of color. We want the depth of value and the depth of color. And the high gloss clear is going to give us clarity so that we see the true pigment colors once it's dry. Whereas a satin clear or a matte clear is going to is going to contain you know, a little bit of flattener, which will affect the view, the clear view of our pigment. So we want depth of pigment color. So we can agitate this up. I can agitate it a little bit more, apart from getting it in a video shot here. But for now, let's get uh, let's get a paper towel and do a test. So we're going to take, do a little test here on the, where the yellow is showing. Let me get a hair dryer. Let's add a little more. We can turn this light off. So that's going to be a usable color for us. Could we still add more red and more black? Well, it's possible. So we could spray and see. At least we know we're going in the right direction with that. If we need a little bit more black, a little bit more red, that is doable. But that's how we make our brown a darker brown. Here was our original color, which is lighter and yellow. In fact, let's just do Let's add a little bit more red 
and a little bit more black. Okay, this is just a little bit more red and a little bit more black. So that's looking pretty good. So I told the customer that I expected that this area might grow if we cleaned it and this brown was soft. So first of all, let's not get too aggressive. Let's put some degreaser here and let's see what happens if we just try to clean So the spot is getting bigger. So I don't think we want to get any more aggressive than that. But the point is, if there is some weakness in the brown in this area, I want all that to come off. So let's continue here. This may be a bit weak too. We're not going to go excessive here. Of course we have our test color over here. Some of that may come off. Although it's not. Well, a little bit. Okay, so more of the brown is coming off here. So we can't get that aggressive with this without removing a good bit more of the brown. So we're kind of limited there on our cleaning stuff. Let's try some alcohol and see what effect that has. All right, alcohol. So that is definitely attacking more of the brown. But at least we've prepped. We don't seem to be taking any of the yellow at all. The yellow is very strong. So I think we need to continue this. I want to see if any of this paint comes off with alcohol. Yes, but we're taking brown with us. Okay. We're taking brown with us. <clears throat> and the paint has already made an impression there as well. So yeah, we're taking the brown top coat. But at least we have something better to start with. And as usual, we've added cross linker 
to the paint that we just mixed up and strain that into our cup. Now if you're not in the business but just happen to stumble on the channel, you might think that the preceding was a bit slow and deliberate, and you're right. However, from technicians in the business, this is our number one requested type of video to present. And this chair gives us the perfect opportunity to fulfill their requests. Now here it was obvious that the first sprayed coat of color did not totally hide these imprints from the paint spots. So what I'm going to do here is just bring all of those white spots up to speed and therefore we can put fewer sprayed coats. Remember, we don't want a solid top coat. You have to be able to see through it. And so our brown coat will also have to be randomized. And for the same reason, we don't want to get too aggressive on these cushions. We want a very light coat at first for the purposes of adhesion. And then when we get to going a little heavier, we want to pay attention to a randomization of our dark coating. We did notice on our initial inspection that these wider areas were quite worn. The yellow was showing through more than in other areas. So we will do an overall light coat of brown on these cushions. Since we have such a dark top coat, this would be a good time to discuss lighting. For an inspection light, I am using a handheld full spectrum light. Also, while we were color matching, I had a LED light on a stand. Now that light can be very useful when you have a residential repair. Also, my eight foot overhead lights are now LEDs also. What I've been doing is uh, every time the fluorescents burn out, I've been converting that fixture to an LED fixture. Now, if you're also going to do this in your shop, if you have a shop, let me suggest to you to buy the LEDs that are daylight bulbs. Here you can see there are two varieties available. One is cool white, and the other in the highlighted line has a DL for daylight. So you'll get the widest spectrum of light from these. And that's something we can use for color matching. Now in my case, the eight foot bulbs are single pin on the end. And they make LEDs in the same configuration. Now to convert the fixture, you need to remove the ballast and of course uh, properly uh, dispose of that. Then all you have to remember is wire both sockets on the one end to the white neutral feed and wire both sockets on the other end to the black power feed. It's as simple as that. And the darker the coating, the more light is required. Why is that? Because Without the intense lighting, all we could see is dark brown. We could not discern the individual colors that made it up. But with intense lighting, now and only now, can you see whether the brown was towards the yellow or towards the purple or could be towards the green or towards the red. You never know until we get plenty of lighting. We need to get all the lighting possible and then a little bit more. This is why it's so easy to blend in 
black, if you're wiping black on, you would think uh, that blends pretty good. It's pretty easy to blend black. Well, that's true because unless you have an intense light, you can't tell any differences between blacks. But uh, if you had enough light, you would see that it's not blended quite like you thought it was. One black may appear to be more brownish. The other black may appear to be more bluish. That's why we don't like to mix our car colors inside a garage or even in the shade. Because then when we pull the car out into the sun, boy, we really do see it in a different light then. I have dealers that try very kindly to offer me a spot inside when it's too hot or too cold. And they don't understand why I want to work outside in the elements. Well, if I work outside in the sunlight, then uh, at least my color is correct. Then I don't have to do the job twice. And in our case, with this chair, the intense light is the only way that we could discern the difference between the yellow in our stock brown color and the purple or violet in the sea. It's the only way we could tell that difference. We could see the complementary contrasts. We knew that we needed purple or violet to take the yellow out of our brown. Only visible with intense lighting in this case. The same intense lighting allowed us to see how the red was affecting the black and how it was turning red into that dark purple or dark violet, we could say. So all of those critical elements of color matching, whether it was subtractive by means of the complementary colors, or whether it was additive, that is, taking two primaries to get a secondary color, it all hinged on getting intense lighting on this particular job. Now, one of our initial observations was that the brown top coat was very soft. And the further we went in our exploration, that proved to be very true. This is the weakest top coat I've ever seen on furniture. And that indicates to me that this top coat was not cross-linked. So this was a very inferior job. Now, sometimes we say that, you know, a product that's made in China is cheap. And in this case, the chair was made in China and the top coat was the cheapest I've seen. But it would be disingenuous to blame this on the Chinese 100%. Because the Chinese are certainly capable of producing things of the very best quality. Uh, but that's not the reason that uh, other countries outsource their jobs to China, is it? No, companies want to outsource to China to try to shave every bit of cost from an item so that they can make the most profits. And we see that this comes even with exploitation of the workforce and the environment. So it would be disingenuous to pressure a Chinese firm to make the absolute cheapest product available and then complain when we get it that it's the cheapest product available. And what about that yellow-orange base coat? That likely is not a sprayed base coat because it's too uniform. That looks to me like a laminate and it could very well be a urethane laminate since it was not affected by anything we tested on it. And usually the urethane laminate is the worst part. But this is the best I have ever seen. A urethane laminate on leather. It is the highest quality I've ever seen. Unfortunately, the top coat did not adhere well to it. But I think it's mostly because the top coat was not cross-linked. By the way, right here, what I'm doing is I'm putting a cross-linked clear this is the same high gloss clear with some additives so that we have the, the most perfect uh, feel. It's got the slip additives, so it has a nice hand when you rub your hand across it. 
everything to put the finishing touches on this chair. And also the reason um, for the clear top coat over everything, you do realize we didn't put, put the uh, dark brown everywhere, but uh, we're protecting the already existing finish. The already existing soft finish that we didn't work on, we are trying to protect that with a little bit of the clear, which is cross-linked. So hopefully the entire chair will now give better service. Now the half inch masking tape was the perfect width for these furniture nails, but even so, uh, underneath there were a couple of spots that needed touched up. So we'll just go back with the brush and hit those without having to spray again. Don't you love it when a plan comes together? Now, during the time I was editing this video, I was also working in the shop, and our friend Gary called me right when I was uh, finishing up this particular job. I had just installed a new air conditioner condenser. You can see where the leaks are here because the oil from the refrigerant has come out and left some, some wet spots. Anyway, um... Uh, I was uh, in the middle of uh, completing this job when Gary called. I'm trying to explain to him something that I just did. And uh, I thought it might be good just to make a short video of what I just did so he can understand what I was talking about. So, Gary, this goes out to you and to any of you who are otherwise mechanically inclined as well. So here's a little tech tip. I've got my AC lines evacuated because I put a new condenser in. Right now I'm pulling a vacuum on the system. I couldn't pull a vacuum before because I had too much of a leak. So what to do? Well, on the end of this yellow vacuum hose, I made a contraption. This goes on the yellow vacuum hose here. This is a a fitting that you would use on a can to open up the can for the refrigerant attach the hose to that and look at here a coupler for my airline which means that I could put positive air pressure into the system and when I did let me get to my light when I did, I found out that the new ring for here was leaking. So I put the old ring in this fitting. This is the AC line to the condenser. And by putting positive air pressure, I could hear the hissing of the air coming from this fitting. So I had to take it apart, put the old washer in there, and now it's holding fine. And the water you see is some soapy water just to see if it would going to bubble up under positive air pressure. So that's how you do it. You put positive air pressure with a gizmo like this. An air fitting connected to the can fitting. And that goes into your vacuum hose. Now it's 81 degrees outside, but uh, don't worry. We've got a refrigerator on wheels. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next video.